introduction. I'll give you uh, the stage and you're going to introduce yourself. Thank you for coming to Italy. This is important for us, it's a year of transition. We're going to move towards the summit number 10 next year. So we're building up as well this sort of international uh, interaction and Andrea Resmin has been working on that on the past few years in creating a relationship with other side of the world, different mental models, different cultures. You've been doing a lot with the understanding groups. You're going to talk to us about not just physical building and architecture and not just digital. You're somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. <laughs> I'll leave the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Uh, my name is Dan Klein, and I'm an information architect from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, this is a joke that most people in the United States laugh at when I show it to them. Uh, where I'm from is not considered to actually be the epicenter of progressive culture. It's a very small town in a place not very many people have been to. And uh, I'm so excited to be in Italy uh, for many reasons, but especially because of how much wonderful architecture there is here. Uh, well, I got to walk around Bologna. My legs are so sore. I walked and walked and walked. Uh, and I also got to go to Venice. And uh, so many wonderful places for people that have been appreciated and lived in for hundreds of years. Uh, where I'm from, uh, the buildings have not been along, around nearly as long. Um, I started a company called The Understanding Group a couple of years ago because uh, my dream is that we could make places out of information that are as good as the places uh, that we uh, build in, in physical space. Uh, I get to teach information architecture at the University of Michigan. And uh, has anybody here seen the O'Reilly book with a polar bear on the cover uh, for information architecture? A few of you have? Excellent. Sorry, Dan, before polar bear distinguish, we need to change the mic because that is not recording on the okay. camera. So sure. I'll just take That's fine. Away. Sorry. Okay, uh, that polar bear book came from uh, the same program that I get to teach in. Peter Morville and Lou Rosenfeld uh, both uh, studied and uh, have taught in this program. So uh, on behalf of the University of Michigan, uh, I'm grateful to be here as well. Uh, talking about architecture, talking about the architecture part of information architecture uh, is something that I'm really interested in. And uh, the work of Richard Saul Werman, who invented uh, information architecture as a way of talking about this work, uh, this May, on May 5th, will be the 40th anniversary of the invention of the idea of information architecture. And one of the reasons that Mr. Werman called it information architecture and not information design is his sense that when you say the word design, some people interpret that as uh, primarily what something looks like. And uh, what he's interested in is not making things look good, uh, but rather to make things be good. And uh, so this, this perspective of information architecture in some ways is a counterpoint uh, against the idea of information design. Uh, and design is a tricky word to interpret, at least in English. I don't know if it's easier to do in Italian. And, uh, this is one way to talk about design that I think is uh, helpful. This is from Jared Spool, and he says that uh, a really simple way that we could talk about design is as the rendering of intent. And that's one of the reasons why I love buildings so much, is uh, these renderings of human intent are so big and so uh, prosaic, you can interpret so much by looking at uh, these renderings of our intent. Uh, so this is an example of a building near where I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This was built by the Steelcase Furniture Corporation in 1989, and the price tag for building this building was $111 million. Uh, the purpose of this building was to bring all of the global uh, participants in their business into one location uh, they wanted to be a vertically integrated company and to have design and production all in one facility. And they invested in a really strangely shaped place to do that. And over the course of 20 years, uh, the world changed. The furniture business of 1989 
is not the furniture business of today. And just recently, this building was sold for only $2.8 million at a huge loss. There were 2,000 people that worked in this building, and now uh, it's empty. And uh, it's become a joke. And back to this definition of design from Jared Spool, if design is the rendering of intent, then some of these renderings of our intent can be read like a text uh, after, maybe after we've, we've finished with it as a product or a service. We can look at the shape of it maybe and say, well, what was it for? And uh, when they built this, they thought that they would have jobs for 2,000 people for a very long time. This building will last hundreds of years, and, uh, and now it's empty. Uh, there are some other very weird buildings near where I live. Uh, this is the corporate headquarters of the Howard Miller Clock Company. Uh, this building was built about 20 years ago, and now is starting to look a little bit dated. It has a, a metal cladding on the outside that is now getting a little bit dirty. Uh, it's a, a it's kind of a strange building, and as you walk around this building to look at it, what this building means starts to reveal itself to you, or at least it does to me, as I try to read this as a rendering of some people's intent. What does this building mean? As soon as you see the logo of the company, I'm sorry, uh, of Howard Miller, and then you recognize that there are two volumes that make up this building, the, the minimal interpretation of this building starts to be, well, it's Howard and Miller, or it's a two-part reflection of the name of the business. And this is what it looks like from the road. If you go around and walk around and park, uh, you cannot see this view of the building from the road. Uh, this is the approach to the front door. Now what this building means seems to start to change. And if you know that they build floor clocks, uh, I start to see that this building is telling the person who's approaching increasingly more about what the place is about, what the company means through this rendering of its intent by building a building for themselves and trying to read it for what it means. So this idea of what buildings are for, one of the purposes of buildings for people is to represent what is true the amount of effort and the amount of time typically that buildings stick around. This is a quote from the, uh, uh, the famous uh, teacher of architecture, Christian Norberg Schultz, a theorist. The idea that when you're making a building, it is somehow reflecting what is true about the culture or the people that made it. And uh, this has been understood in architecture for a very long time it is now starting to become a way of thinking and talking about what we do in digital. And uh, what's true about a place like this, which has endured for generations, uh, that is the kind of thinking that now we may start to be able to take for digital. Uh, when Apple introduced its new music service and used the, this musician, Trent Reznor, from Nine Inch Nails to introduce it, the framing used for this service, which I'm sad to report uh, is not a good service, uh, but the, his voicing of the need, so he's speaking on behalf of people who love music and who make music, that there needs to be a place that brings this all together. Because that's what places do for us, is it makes a whole bunch of things that are important to us coherent in a really specific way, and hopefully a way that's true. And what's true about music, uh, and the way Apple service has been delivered, there's a disconnect there. But still this idea that we want it to be a place. A place that's made of information. Uh, What's amazing about some of these places that we've made in the built environment is that the reasons we think that they're good change over time. When this building was built in 1955, the reasons why people celebrated it as one of the finest examples of architecture in the Western world had a lot to do with religion, for some of them. Today, this building is still revered, and for many different reasons than the reasons when it was originally built. Um, so the, the truth that architecture represents does not have to be, and it clearly is not a static truth. It can change along with us, even though the shape of this has not changed. The reasons why it is good have changed. 
This is a very strange building that uh, is in the United States. This is called the Sculpture House by Charles Deaton. It's near uh, Aspen, Colorado. And uh, you may recognize this uh, structure from the movie Sleeper by Woody Allen. It was used as a futuristic space age sort of uh, setting for a very strange film. The architect said that when he made the shape of this, he didn't want the shape of it to mean anything. He wanted the shape to not be weighted down by other people's meanings. What I find so curious in architecture is that the same shapes for one person that aren't meant to mean anything, another architect can use that same vocabulary of shapes and styles and mean something different. This is Aero Saarinen's TF, uh, I'm sorry, TWA Flight Center in New York. And uh, what he was trying to do with this shape was uh, very different than the other guy. He wanted this shape. This is his father's design principle, that you should always design a thing by thinking about its next larger context. What is the next larger context from an airport? This is 1962, and it, looks, it already looks like the next larger context, which is a spaceport. So here we have two architects using very similar shapes and colors and styles with very different meanings. And uh, this drives me crazy, because I would like to be able to know which of these is good. What does good mean with regard to the shape of the things that we make? Uh, what is a good structure? How would you know it was good? On what basis can we say the structure is good? Clearly, this structure uh, has endured for centuries. We, most people would agree that this is good. Uh, here's a modern building here in Bologna. Uh, you are famous for having hundreds of miles of beautiful arcades. This building has arcades. They employed some of the same tactics of buildings that everybody says are good, but I'm not sure that this one is good. Uh, the strategy in the entire built community here of arcades is a good strategy, but the application of those tactics in a different context somehow don't work for me. So I, I want to know how this all works. And I was, uh, I was given a piece of really hard advice by a man I admire very much, uh, Mr. Mormon. Uh, he doesn't believe that there is a right way. There are good ways, but to relieve ourselves of the idea that there is a correct way of figuring this out. Uh, that is a teaching that I struggle with, but uh, let's work with it for a little while today. And let's also recognize that we are in a very immature field, that this is nascent. And when you are in the nascent stage of the development of something, uh, you can do uh, goofy things and that that's okay. For example, uh, when the automobile was nascent, uh, this particular model has a buggy whip and no horses. <laughs> but there's a place for the whip um, in 1894. And this looks ridiculous to us. Here's an even more ridiculous looking early automobile. <laughs> this is the uh, horsey horseless from North America. The other one was from England. And we laugh at this, but then if you look at the culture and the context of the time this emerged, when there were horses and cars on the road at the same time, this was, this was, this was smart. This was good structure for the time it was invented. And today it looks pretty silly. So if it's true that there's no correct way, uh, but we recognize that there are some good ways, uh, how might we get to something good? Uh, I'm proposing at least three ways of working that might help us get to good structure. And the first one is to map intention. And in the built environment, you can see the difference between the map of the civic planner's intention and what people do <laughs> in the paths uh, that mark the difference. And from uh, satellites, the differences between what people who make the world think would be good and what people who use the world need, you can see these differences quite vividly. Uh, so it would be good to see the difference between what we intend and what we do. Uh, if design is the rendering of intent, 
then let's have a really good map of our intentions. And a good map, um, so I'm full of questions today. What's a good structure? What's a good map? <laughs> Uh, according to Korzybski, a good map, uh, not only do you have to recognize that it is different from the territory, we know this, but the other part of this quote is even more interesting to me, which is to be a good map, it should be like the territory it's mapping. And if the territory we're mapping is people, what are people like? People are full of complexity and contradiction. People are a mess, and so the kinds of maps that we need to truthfully map our intention need to be messy and they need to be able to deal with complexity and contradiction because that's what we are like. The way websites and apps and digital things get made today do not recognize this complexity and contradiction. The form of the documents we use to build places made of information, a business requirements document in a perfectly straight table with a seemingly sensible progression of requirements and steps is a lie. But this is what we use typically to map our intentions. The world is never this clean. Uh, so instead of trying to use a, uh, a table, I'm proposing, uh, try this out for yourselves, use a continuum, uh, set things up, and these are called performance continuums. This is a tool that I uh, stole from Richard Saul Worman he wrote a book in 1972 called The Nature of Recreation, teaching people how to design parks for everyone. And how do you design something for a whole bunch of different people? You need a continuum of needs to design against, so a performance continuum. Take two things that are hard to do that you're trying to accomplish. You need to do both things. Most of the businesses that I consult for need to do both of these things. They need to acquire new customers, and they need to take care of the customers that they have. Uh, oftentimes, this is presented as a pick one. <laughs> you can have either one or the other. But uh, what this tool allows us to do is to say, uh, no, let's say yet. Uh, we can acquire and yet we can service. We can optimize, yet we can innovate. Uh, we can address what we need to do for today while not throwing away our opportunity for what we're going to do for the future. If we map our intention on a continuum instead of in a uh, brittle series of yes and no requirements. The difference between the truth of what's going to happen and what you intend is the intersection of the poles on these continuums. And to know in ahead of time, people will still probably do different things than what you intend. But if you had a map of what you intended, you could see the difference between where you thought servicing and acquiring were going to collide and where they actually do. So get all the people who are deciding the hard things in your project together. Uh, put all of their intention onto that map of the hard things that you need to do together and then uh, go render something that matches this map of intent. And if you do this with enough of these hard questions, and you get people to indicate where we should go, what good means for our project, eventually you will have a little constellation of things that start to indicate what a good structure would be. And this is the most dangerous point in the project. <laughs> When it starts to look like you know what you should do, when you jump directly from intent into structure um, on the basis of confidence uh, or uh, how are you going to do this, this is a dangerous time. Uh, another piece of wisdom from Mr. Werman, uh, designers are going to jump to start solving the problem. That's just what designers do. And this is why it's so dangerous, because before jumping in and solving the problem, there's this opportunity to ask the question, again, if, if places uh, are where architecture represents what's true, uh, before we jump to designing something, remaining in the mode of architecture and asking, what is the truth about what we're trying to do here, before jumping into designing a structure? And it's extraordinarily easy with the frameworks that we have today, when the whole language of the interface is already there waiting to go, 
you can just jump from your idea into a structure very quickly. Uh, the lesson to be learned from that, at least in the built environment, uh, does anybody recognize this humble little structure? This is the very first Pizza Hut. And I don't know this for sure, but this is a story I'm going to make up about how this happened. Uh, there were some kids in a college town and they knew they wanted to start a pizza place. And their uncle had a very small house that was not occupied and they started their business in this little hut-like place. And they made the mistake of calling the business Pizza Hut. And from this point forward, every place that they do business looks like a hut. And they can't get rid of the hut. And it's not because huts have anything to do with pizza. It's because they named themselves after the initial structure that they took for their business. And there's nothing so uh, long-lasting as a temporary solution. And the temporary solution of saying, let's be the Pizza Hut, uh, means that forever they must be in buildings that look like this. And when they go out of business, other businesses try to move into these structures, and you still see the Pizza Hut. My, again, I don't know if this is true, but my, uh, can, my prediction is they sell more pizza subs at Larry's Sub Shop than at any other kind. The pizza is still here, even though it's not here. There's a very wonderful podcast about this called Used to Be a Pizza Hut, about all of the creative ways people have tried to reuse these buildings, and you can't get the pizza out of these pizza huts. So uh, be careful. Don't just jump from intention to structure. First, start with mapping your inten intentions, and then take the next step, which is to play around with the arrangement. Uh, back to that quote from Mr. Warman, because there is no one correct way to arrange the p components in your system, uh, take the opportunity to play with them before putting it into one structure and going with it. Because when you change the organization of something, this is a quote from uh, Mr. Warman in 1989, the creative organization of information creates new information. A different arrangement of the elements will mean something different than another. The analogy that he uses in uh, the book Information Anxiety is dogs. That what is possible to understand about dogs completely depends on how you arrange them when you are trying to learn about them. The dogs do not change, but what you can understand about them is very dependent on the way that you arrange them. And this is part of the traditional value that information architects bring to digital. This is a picture of the Department of Human Resources at the University of Michigan, a client of ours. Left to their own devices, they will make navigation everywhere. A link for every single person in the organization, everywhere. 16 or 17 primary navigation options. And what this is trying to mean uh, this is a top university that's trying to attract the best talent in the world. This place doesn't do it. And the reason is because of the arrangement. We, so we did work with them and our, our agreement was we couldn't take anything away. Millions of links, you can't take any of them away, but you are permitted to rearrange them. And the rearrangement of their world into three primary navigation choices and the opportunities that that created in the space of their digital place where they do business and need to compete for the best people in the world, we didn't take anything away, but the new arrangement sets them up as a more uh, successful business. Changes in arrangement change meaning. What is the difference between a thesaurus and a dictionary? What's the difference between a rhyming dictionary and a regular dictionary? Uh, Apple's new news product. It's the same news as you would get through the web browser, but through a different arrangement. They are creating a premium service. Same content, different arrangement, different meaning. Uh, my best friend Abby Covert in her book, uh, How to Make Sense of Any Mess, uh, also points out that not only is arrangement meaningful, uh, the absences in an arrangement are also meaningful. Uh, how many of us would benefit from, in a digital place like Amazon, 
being able to see what isn't there. So oftentimes, retailers digitally will remove the products that are not there anymore because they don't want to disappoint us. That's taking away an opportunity for us to understand. And the difference between what is present in the arrangement and what isn't in the arrangement is also meaningful. Probably the best definition of information architecture yet spoken, and I'm sure that we can continue to improve it, uh, but I love this way of saying it from Jorge Arango, that information architecture is concerned with, it's all about the structural integrity of meaning across contexts. Evernote has different ways of delivering its service for every device you can imagine, and somehow it means the same thing in all of those different contexts. There are certain features you cannot access in certain contexts, but it still all is coherent, uh, due in part to having done a very wise arrangement to make sure that it means the same thing everywhere you encounter it. So for you all, uh, wherever you do your work, uh, just like you can start uh, mapping your intentions with something as simple as a line and some dots and some words, how do you start working with arrangement? Uh, the place to start is with a map, uh, again with the maps. And uh, this is an example from 1972 from the work of uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown from a book called Learning from Las Vegas. And what they did was an inventory of every word on every sign on the Las Vegas Strip. Taking the meaning off of all of the signs on all of the buildings and, and considering it as its own sort of world of language. You can do an audit of all of the labels and all of the navigation and all of the wayfinding of whatever product or service you're working on and start to look at the way that those things are arranged and consider the ways that your meaning would be different if you arranged it differently. Okay, so moving from intent through meaning and then finally to structure. And uh, so the third recommendation that I have for you, uh, map your intentions, arrange things, and play with the arrangement uh, to get at meaning, and then uh, use some really dumb models to make that real for people and for yourself. Uh, this is a picture of how architects used to make models. Uh, I think that the advent of computer-aided design has done a terrible disservice to the clients of architects today uh, because a model like this is not a picture. Uh, a model like this is rhetoric. A model like this is making an argument for how the space uh, ought to be set up. Nobody's going to look at this and mistake it for the actual building as, uh, as happened in that movie Zoolander. Um, this is an argument for how to use space, and you can make this as quickly as in an afternoon and you can reject it as easily as you can accept it. Conceptual models in the kinds of work that we do, this is a real uh, piece of work that I did for a, for a client, can be incredibly dumb. And I mean not stupid dumb, uh, but naive dumb. Helping to uh, make sure that we all understand what we're doing and what we're working with. Uh, the model on the left here is how their world used to be set up. And uh, our recommendation was to make the arrangement different, to change the size and the relationship of some of the pieces. And we didn't have to draw any pictures of interfaces. We didn't have to draw sitemaps or pictures of uh, tabs and navigation bars to work this out. We worked out most of the details of how to set up this world in the dumbest possible way, just with circles and words. Uh, another really dumb way to work that we love to do is to have a metaphor to use for what the approach is going to be so that everybody on the team understands what we're doing. Uh, this is also taken from the work of Venturi and Scott Brown from Learning from Las Vegas. They were able to classify everything in the built environment in Las Vegas in one of two really dumb and therefore clear ways. They said either a building is a duck like this duck-shaped building that's selling duck eggs. Uh, <laughs> it's a duck where its shape is telling you exactly what it's about, um, or it's uh, a decorated shed. Um, 
And here's an example from near where I live. This is from the Japanese American architect Minoru Yamasaki, who designed the World Trade Center. Uh, this is for a medical association. And the shape of the building is saying association. It is saying through the literal equal apportioning of space that all of the participants in this association are equal. This is a duck. And if you knew with your client ahead of time that what we should be doing with structure is having the structure tell our story, then you're making ducks. And wouldn't it be nice to know that and have a name for it? Uh, like the Apple Watch, I would say, is a duck. Uh, the attributes of a duck, uh, the ornament is part of its structure. It's innovative and revolutionary and original and it's beautiful on every surface and it's advanced and it looks expensive. All of these things, if you knew in advance that that's what you were trying to do, uh, would be helpful. I think the booking system for Virgin America, if you've not seen it, there's lots of videos about it on the internet because it's so interactive. This is a duck. This experience is so patently Virgin America, you could not mistake it for anybody else's experience. And so if you know that you're doing a duck, you need to be really clear what you're trying to make. Uh, this amplifies your meaning. The structure is going to be telling your story for you. And uh, there's a lesson in an American film called uh, Welcome, or this is Spinal Tap, I believe is the film. Uh, it can be a joke if it gets shrunk down. If you're trying to do something really meaningful with structure and then your budget gets cut in half, you might end up with a little tiny Stonehenge and midgets uh, instead of a glorious structure. So uh, as a way to talk with your team, what is the meaning of what we're trying to do? If you say our structure will help tell our story, you need to protect your budget uh, even more than in maybe some other circumstances. So the other way, if you're not making a duck, you're making a decorated shed just a box with a sign on it, and you can change the sign as what's in the box changes. And uh, this is a perfectly acceptable strategy, and some of us think we're making ducks when actually what we're making are decorated sheds, or what would be good to make would be a decorated shed. This is also a building by uh, Minoru Yamasaki. This is one of his first buildings in Detroit. It's a little donut shop. Uh, this structure does not say donut shop. It just says shop. You can, there's been 15 or 20 different businesses in this space, and it's neutral. It's fine. Uh, compared to the Apple Watch being a duck, uh, you could maybe consider the Microsoft Band as a decorated shed. It's, uh, the, the, what's pretty about it has been sort of applied to it. Um, it's ordinary. It's an evolution of some other thing that you already know. Uh, the front side is more beautiful than the other sides of it. Uh, it looks cheap and it's a little inconsistent in its execution. Uh, the only way that you really know it's Microsoft is that little logo stuck on the band. So uh, this approach, if you could say to your team, you know what, for this iteration, for this version of our product, we are not going to be so bold as to say the structure of it is going to help tell our story and convey meaning. We're going to do the, sh the structure of this in a neutral way. Embrace that. Um, it's less risky, but it's it increases your dependency on the context it is going to be in. If the meaning isn't in the structure, then the structure will be dependent on meaning from somewhere else. Um, and it also increases the demand for being really good at execution. If this is just a box with a sign on it, it has to be really well executed. So why, why good structure? Why does this matter? Um, this is a picture that my friend David Peter Simon took on Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, places that are made of information that we go to all the time, where increasingly what we need to be productive and happy in our uh, culture is happening in places made of information. In the United States, we spend 40 hours every month. And this is civilians spending 40 hours a month. Uh, people like my mom, not professional internet builders. 150 times a day looking at the smartphone. Uh, how can we make those places as good as the best places that are in the built environment? The crisis is building. Everywhere I go, I am in places where there are participants who are absent, uh, yet they are present. This 
co-occurrence of the places made of information with the physical places that we occupy is a problem we are ill-equipped to understand. Um, and so elevating the level of what we need to accomplish in the digital places to say they need to be as good as the physical places, the separation of these is going to fall away very soon if it hasn't already fallen away. So the same ideas about what makes a place good in physical space need to be the ones informing cyberspace because they co-occur all the time. Uh, this is from Google Ngrams. Uh, if you haven't seen this tool, uh, it's a survey of uh, thousands and thousands of books. Uh, I did this in English from the year 1700 through the year 2000. And what it shows is a pattern of uh, right about the time of the Industrial Revolution when complexity started to become a real problem for everyday life, the difference between starting to uh, be in a mode of looking for solutions to problems and being in quick problem, jumping to solve the problem mode seems to be uh, inversely proportional to talking about the truth. And uh, until we can talk about what is true, about what's good for people, as a valid uh, set of uh, criticisms for making digital, I think the tendency will just be to continue to think about solving problems and missing the opportunity to ask about what's true. Uh, and if, if you're going to include that question about what's true in your work, uh, my proposal is that there are these three ways of working that will help you bring that to your work. Mapping, arranging, and modeling. And two principles. Uh, if it's true what Mr. Worman said, which I struggle with, that there's no correct way, uh, there must be some principles. Uh, so just two principles to close this off. And the first principle is to be clear. Uh, the answer to complexity is not simplification. Uh, the answer to complexity is clarification. Back uh, 40 years ago, in 1976, when Mr. Werman invented information architecture, the definition was making the complex clear. So whatever you're doing, if it is not toward clarity, uh, perhaps you're doing it wrong. And then, and perhaps a little more controversially, um, wholeness. Uh, since the time of the Industrial Revolution, if not since the time of Descartes, the idea that you can separate out what something is from what it's supposed to mean, or that you could do something for functional reasons and separate out the reasons of beauty and aesthetic, uh, that has led to a very fragmented world. And the prediction is that there will be, I think it's 150,000 new things added to the Internet of Things every second by the year 2020. That is a multiplication of fragments of things that is just bewildering to comprehend. So in the choices that we make as designers, architects, planners, strategists, uh, what is it toward? What are we doing? If you've been given the opportunity to make yet another microsite, because making it cohere with the regular website is too hard, that is not toward wholeness. That is exacerbating the problem of fragmentation. And I think all of us have opportunities in our work to say, uh, let's not focus on a thing. Let's talk about the pattern that makes all of these things what they are. Um, to not focus on making an app, uh, but to think about ecosystems. And that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for the inspiring opening, and thank you very much for using simple words to explain complex stuff there. Because you've been talking about, I've well, been rearranging my information around your your biography here. Uh, you've been talking about mapping, arranging, and uh, the models, modeling. But what happened when not everything is in control. I mean, when the designer, the architect, is not in control of deciding what's the intent and the meaning, and is called in by a client who wants just him for structure. So what if the intent is that it's not right or wrong, but what if the intent and the rearranging of the meaning is already pre-decided by the client, and uh, the design comes a bit late in this process? 
Yeah, that working in conditions where you do not have the latitude to make very wide ranging changes and, and choices, uh, that is more often than not how, how I work every day. And uh, sometimes in doing these models and maps, uh, from a sense of what would be humane, we make them for ourselves, but we don't show them to the client. If the client isn't willing to talk about what is true about their organization, if we as uh, analysts see parts of a structure that are highly disordered and dysfunctional, and that are coming from uh, interpersonal dynamics in the organization, uh, for us to shine a bright light on, on some disorder in the organization would be inhumane. So trying to find, uh, a, I think the, the short answer is humility. Uh, architecture is a service business. That's one of the reasons why Mr. Worman uh, was bankrupt as an architect and has only really worked for himself is because he can't listen to other people. Uh, he's obsessed with doing it right so much that he can't listen to other people. Uh, and so if, if you want to work that way, uh, he, he provides an interesting model, which is uh, just be brilliant and make yourself rich and then you won't have to work for anyone. Uh, but, but I have to work for other people and uh, the opposite approach is more effective for me, which is a place of humility of I'm dumb, my models are really dumb, I don't understand anything. Uh, so to, to emphasize my ignorance in the exchange while trying to make whatever the appropriate steps, and maybe they're just little baby steps towards some of this stuff, but uh, certainly if you gave me uh, supreme power to change everything from the top down, uh, that would be better. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've got five minutes, which means we can ask three short questions or two regular questions. So that is, we'll go. Thank you, Francesco, for passing the mic. So, uh, a very short question. You showed a graph in which uh, problem was increasing around the 1890s, uh, you know, as in inverse proportion to the truth. Yeah. Yes. What does that represent? These are mentions in books in the English language that Google has digitized. It was a short question. <laughs> are there any objections to anything you've heard today? Ooh, excellent. Um, my question is, are dumb models diverse enough to create different things, things that are different? Um, we have limited ourselves to paper as uh, the primary uh, medium for the dumb models that we make. And within that quite limited medium of two-dimensional surface of paper, we use size to our advantage. So sometimes uh, we've had a roll of paper that would go out the door and down the stairs it's so long, 400 feet long. Uh, just within paper, there are enough ways that you can do these dumb models that uh, we've primarily been hired by big companies with complex information problems. So the nature of the problem we are solving with these dumb models is the same. Uh, I've not been working very much with uh, apps or with uh, interactive television or those types of things. So the degree to which they help for the more highly experiential interactive media, I can't speak to from personal experience, but my sense is uh, the dumber the better. And uh, I often like to think that uh, we could just go outside and if I had a stick in the dirt, that uh, most of the value of what I can bring to any client context, if, if, I, if I need a tool that's more than a stick in the dirt, then maybe I need to work on my thinking more to be clearer. So, so my said, that's a long way of saying, I think these dumb models can, 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 can solve any problem that you throw at them. Uh, and if you hit resistance, make them dumber. <laughs> maybe they're not dumb enough if, if they're not working as well for you as you'd like. 
We've got time for one last question. Maybe the lucky one. No questions? Well, I, I will be here all day, and uh, if you have questions, please come ask them. And you've been very kind. Thank you for your attention.